I'm Ryan Jeffrey, and this is the Passionate About OSS podcast. The purpose of the podcast is to shine a light on some of the brilliant minds in the OSS and telco industry, to uncover a little bit about their backgrounds, but also some of their knowledge, tips, and techniques to share with you, the audience. This episode will look at what it takes to get a major OSS project off the ground. Today's guest is slightly unique for this podcast because he's actually not really all that passionate about OSS at all. His passions lay elsewhere, focusing on market development, particularly in tech and comms, but specifically space and satellite. However, OSS and BSS have proven pivotal in developing some of these ideas that he's worked on. The complexity of OSS requires collaborative solution development, and our guest is a real expert in this space. So it's a pity we couldn't actually have him on as episode seven. It would have been great to have him on because he's really the James Bond of the OSS industry. He's adept at hand-to-hand combat, has a passion for fast cars, has the calm, rugged demeanor of Daniel Craig and is always impeccably dressed. He doesn't mind the gadgets as well. So welcome to today's guest, Ashley Neal. Thanks, Ryan. I think uh, two out of those five comments are correct. It's up to the audience to work out which ones. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll run a poll at the end. Sure. So Ashley and I first met in around about 2017 when he was at the pointy end of a $100 million plus managed telco service deal. He was already well into the process before we got connected, but we'll have a, a chat a little bit more about that later on. Would it be accurate to say that your real passion is solution selling rather than OSS? Uh, if it was to choose between the two, absolutely. Um, but, you know, I did think about this question earlier, Ryan, and, um, you know, I don't know if I'm really passionate about selling, so to speak. Um, you know, it's kind of a weird thing to be passionate about, but, you know, I, I think I'm um, probably more pa- just curious about about people and, and what motivates them and drives them. And, uh, you know, I think being good at selling is probably just a byproduct of that curiosity. Mm, and developing um, markets, developing products, developing projects, would that be more of the the point of the rainmaking that you do? You know, it's interesting to make what people tick and, and you know, I think once you get a sense of people, then you get a sense of, you know, as you zoom out a little bit on that, you get a sense of how communities work and, and once you understand communities or tribes, then you understand how markets work. You know, it's all quite, it's all quite emotional when you, boil it down to it, my personal view. Mm. And if you get a, if you can work out what drives the individual, you can typically work out what drives the group. And that's what drives markets. You know, no nobody nails it, but uh, it's just a really interesting thing to um to investigate. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, do you think we can ever get you across to the dark side of being passionate about OSS? Ah oh, mate, if anyone's gonna do it, you will. <laughs> <laughs> So telco tech satellite is a real theme that goes back uh, nearly 20 years through your career. Um, What was it? Where did those passions come from or where did those opportunities come from to deal in those industries? Mate, people always say, you know, they fell into their career. Well, not always say that, but certainly people who are career professionals in sales. And, um, you know, I don't know if I'm that much different. So in hindsight, it feels like it was a really good plan. So my university degree was in information systems and and I kind of went to uni just before the dot-com boom. And so everybody was talking, if you remember, you've got to get into IT and you know, that's where the money is going to be made in the future. So, you know, I was no different. So I got into technology. Before I finished my degree, I started working for a software company that had raised a bunch of capital pre-2000. And they had a, the development house was in Melbourne and they had a sales office over in the US. And, uh, you know, I started working with a bunch of guys who, you know, lived off Coke and pizza and, um, you know, were coding all day and, and playing games all night. Like it was, it was a weird... nothing changes the same thing right. today, 20 <laughs> yeah. years later, right? Maybe you're right. Yeah. So you know, I did that, and that, but I realized super quickly, I am not a great programmer. So, and, and I thought if I, if this was my future, I couldn't compete with these geniuses. So you know, I you can relate uh, to that in a big way as well. <laughs> So then uh, I guess my first insight into professional selling then was, you know, the CEO of that company was a um, you know, pretty charismatic person and, and has gone on to be a mentor, a good friend of mine in life. You know, he turned up one day, you know, <laughs> I think he was driving a Porsche and you know, rocked into the office in, in queue and he had some, you know, he literally turned up with gaming controllers for the, 
guys in the office and uh, you know, I sort of talked to him and uh, yeah, how he met is another interesting story uh, before that. But long story short, it, yeah, he kind of inspired me to say, you know, why don't you look at selling? And he worked out pretty quickly that get it, sitting um, in front of a computer and, and writing code wasn't the future for me. And uh, he started mentoring me into selling. So, you know, we found some opportunities for this product and this product really interestingly was a way to compress, encode, encode and compress video that you could send over email. Um, and they they pivoted to post videos online. So it was a really early YouTube before mm-hmm. there was ever a YouTube. It was, um, yeah, it was pretty cool stuff. So they had some customers in Europe and some customers in the US, uh, but you know, the funding fell away from them after the dot-com bust. Mm. Um, so that's how I got into it and then, then went into, uh, got a bug for, for website design out of that mm. and um, started up a website development company and then had a little brief foray into uh, recruitment. And I mean brief, maybe six months. And uh, but, but when I was doing it, I found, I met a lot of salespeople of various levels of experience and, um, you know, maybe I thought a lot of these people, yeah, I could, I could do what they did. And from my own experience running a business, you know, I found customer. I worked out how to price by ringing companies in the yellow pages and saying, "Hi, oh, I've just started a business in website design. How do you charge for this sort of stuff? You know, how do you find customers?" And I found everyone to be super helpful. Mm-hmm. And then you're meeting some of these professionals. I don't know. They just, they just didn't inspire me. But the, the small few that did, who'd made a career of it. You know, they uh, they seemed to have a pretty good life. You know, they were curious about the world. They were, you know, good individuals, had a good life. And so that's uh, – and then I just followed those paths. So out of recruitment, I got into um, – I kind of came up with this idea with my mentor, and Andrew, and he – and we came up with this idea thinking and there are small companies out there who are run by engineers and we keep saying, you know, they can only sell to their mum so often. So they, you know, they sell to people that they know, you know, their, their mum being their former employer or something like that. And and uh, it was really consistent. And they just didn't know how to get out of that circle of influence, which were people they'd worked with in the past. And so they, you know, tried to hire salespeople. But, you know, I'm sure we'll get into it later. But I would suggest that engineers have a very particular view of the sales profession. And because of that, I don't think they know how to hire good salespeople. Um, so we found a little niche in the marketplace where we could work with engineers and provide them sales resources. So we provided people to do cold calls for them. We provided people who could do meetings for them, could close business, run contracts, run other sales teams, that sort of thing. And um, and we did pretty well for a little while. Um, and then so that was that was and it was all technology because that's what we were interested in. That's what we knew. And then one of our customers effectively bought the business out and they were in the satellite industry. So that we'd never been involved in satellite, but the fundamentals of professional selling, I don't think change. So we got into that. And um, I think we got in at the right time. That business was doing some interesting things. And, you know, we tried to launch a satellite and a few other stuff and had a lot of success in that business. And, and uh, that led me to Speedcast, um, which led me to meet you. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. I actually wasn't uh, wasn't familiar with the uh, pivot, um, so that's a really interesting uh, re- interesting segue into space and satellite. And did you fall in love with space and satellite per se, or was it more just that the opportunities happened to align through with Speedcast and your earlier initiatives? I definitely didn't look at the industry and say, right, you know, satellite is the industry to be involved in. I'd never heard of it. I didn't realise Australia had a satellite industry. So yeah, once we're involved in it, it's a we found out it's a really small industry, but it's got a lot of revenue being spent on it. There's very little competition in the marketplace, which is which is really good. And the other thing is it's not well known by by customers. So you know you can add a lot of value with your knowledge of the industry when you talk to people. If you if you talk to customers about networking or about IP, you know what they probably have a lot of experience themselves, and so the the discussion tends to get back fall back to price pretty quickly. But I found that in the satellite industry and the space industry in general, you know, customers are scared about it because it's not something they've grown up with. And so you, mm-hmm. they, they really do look for value. They really do look for people that they can trust and that will support them in not making bad decisions. And so mm-hmm. we kind of, you know, again, that's what they look from everybody, but the satellite industry is just seemed to be full of people who are pretty passionate about it. You know, when we got into it, again, it was very fledgling, but it was, I got involved just when the mining boom was kicking off in Western Australia and, 
uh, to drive mining, communications was an important part to keep people on site to to drive technology out on these mine sites. And so I moved to Perth and, uh, yeah, right place, right time, right technology, you know, the right enthusiasm of the job. And and uh, we had a lot of success kind of deploying satellite services into the West Australian market. Mm. And one of the things I've noticed the real trend across people in telco, there seems to be a, a lot of people who are really interested in space. Was that something that you were interested in as well? I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> you know, I don't think I'm special. It's it's just super interesting what I'm doing now. Um, you know, working with a with a T1 telco. The, you, you mentioned space, and it gets everybody's attention. So you know, it is it is cool. It's inspiring for people. You know, I think Elon Musk has got it right to say. You know, you don't have to be involved in it, but it it's 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 happy to watch from the sidelines because it's very interesting. So that's uh, you know, I'm I'm interested in it as a as a fan. But it's really cool that I can get involved in the ecosystem of of delivering capability as well. Mm-hmm. And you talked briefly about Speedcast. So Speedcast was the vehicle through which we met. Are you able to tell us a little bit about Speedcast and its specific niches? Yeah, so I'm a little bit out of Speedcast now, but certainly the time when we met um, a few years ago, yeah, Speedcast is a, is a great story. I you know, started by a guy who kind of found a, a gap in the marketplace for companies selling services. So he sold some services based on a little business in Hong Kong and uh, he grew organically for a little while, um, but, you know, he thought big, which is fantastic. So he raised some money and, and went on the acquisition path and where the big growth in satellite services were was in Australia because we had such a big oil and gas and, and mining boom. And we've just got such a big land mass and, and very little connectivity where all the mining assets are satellite was just going great guns here so he bought a number of companies in australia four or five i think and then listed the organization in australia on the asx and that's used that as a jumping off point for acquisitions around the world so you know i think um i think you know 18 months ago they were the biggest satellite services company in the world i think their market cap it might have even hit a billion at one point so yeah, they, did some, they did some big things. I think 1,500 staff, uh, but yeah, it kind of, you know, I think they, they lost their feet from under themselves and had a bit of a struggle last year. They did back out from that. But uh, yeah, when I was working with them, they were an amazing company and some awesome people. And your role really largely related around identification of new opportunities to, to grow that picture, to grow that pool for Speedcast. So to be successful at that must require certain skills and mindsets. Yep. So when I started, I uh, my, yeah, my first job with Speedcast was to help them transition customers across to uh, from the two companies. So I worked for the company called NewSat, and Speedcast had acquired them, and they uh, so I sort of hung around for a little bit, making sure the customers felt safe moving across to a new uh, supplier. Uh, and then I took over the role of running the sales team, which is something that I uh, do get a kick out of in the sense that. You know, managing other professionals uh, who are carrying a target and then being responsible for a regional target. It was, it's interesting. Again, it's a, just the concept of managing people is awesome. Um, but in the middle of all that, there was this opportunity with, with NBN who were kicking around the idea of, of building a, a business satellite service using some surplus capacity they had on two satellites that they launched in the marketplace. And so I got involved early with them and, and, uh, yeah, you know, four years later, NBN bought that business off Speedcast. So being an engineer, I'd always look down on salespeople, that, that sort of sleazy used car uh, connotations that you get. But that perception's really changed over the last few years. That the, the salespeople are, are really the true rainmakers. What they can conceptualise and sell of a solution delivers a great benefit to many. Uh, so all of us sort of tech nerds in the industry uh, rely on the, the the projects that the rainmakers actually uh, develop. So I'd love to hear your perspective on the importance of your role to firing off new projects, firing off big opportunities like you touched on with NBN, um, and we'll talk about it in a little bit more depth shortly. Yeah, so, you know, my view of the sales function in a business is – that I think every organization needs to have a needs to be able to demonstrate that they've got a sustainable income stream. And yeah, there's a great book 
by a guy called Michael Treacy called The Discipline of Market Leaders. And it kind of, in my mind, describes the best kind of high level view of how a business sees itself. So you'll, in, in, in that book, they talk about this concept of organizations that see themselves as a product leader, a price leader, or something they call customer intimate leader. And you, know, you might find a very heavily engineering driven company to be a product leader. Um, and there's a lot of those around. And, and they lead just by the fact that their product is the best in the market uh, and they believe in, and it's proven that their product sells itself. So that might be the early iPod, that might be the early iPhone, that sort of thing. You know, a price leader kind of uh, makes sense in itself when the price leader is a company just the cheapest in the marketplace. You probably don't need a lot of salespeople out there. You know, they, you know, they, they need to be good at taking orders, but you know, they're not, they don't need to convince someone that buying the cheapest is something for consideration. But I reckon in, in the enterprise world, companies buy service and they buy a particular experience. And if you're going to buy an experience, you need somebody out in front of your company representing what that experience looks like. And that's where I think salespeople, good quality ones, should sit. They should, they should represent to prospective customers what the experience of being a customer would be like. So how responsive are you going to be? How much insight are you going to provide into your marketplace? Whatever it is that your product represents. And so, you know, I think at a particular level, that's the role of a, of a salesperson. So they need to go out and identify where those opportunities sit in the marketplace. They need to understand enough about their own company to work out what's, what's high valuable and what's the, what they can actually deliver to a high quality. They need to have the confidence to, to pick up the phone and, and actually generate that first discussion, which is, you know, pretty challenging. You would know as a business owner, it's, it's a, that's an amazing skill that is really uh, lost in the sales profession is generating leads and good quality ones, you know, like not, not sounding sleazy, not sending out spam emails, but being able to speak to someone and, and add some value in a, in a phone call. And we'll get onto that with MBN, you, the ability to excite interest where in something that was brand new that had never really existed in that form before. Yeah. So yeah, you're hundred percent right. You know, we all do it ourselves. You know, we, we, we get pitched to every day by someone and uh, you know, something cause, catches our eye. You know, it's the old school, it's advertising on TV. Something will catch our eye, but you know, in, in the corporate world, you've got to quickly establish that you can add value to that person's life and also to that business. And I think you need to be able to link a, an individual success with a business result as well. Yeah, and do that using good language. So it's yeah, it's a it's a tricky art, I think. So yeah, to answer your question, what do I think the role is? You know, I don't think every business needs to rely on salespeople at a high level, you know, or rainmakers that you call them. But I think some businesses who have to deliver a particular service or have to communicate complex ideas to to you know an audience of varying skill sets and understanding, it requires a very particular uh, set of skills, you know, a very particular trade it's a trade because it's sociological trade it's something that you can only learn over time it's very difficult to do a course and then understand how to be good at that profession you just have to do it through making a hell of a lot of mistakes and working out what works for you because it also you need to tie that in with a particular personality that you have you know it's the thing that you're good at um, yeah. and so that that's where i think those rainmakers get together and and uh to answer your early question about you know having a having a mindset about it yeah, i'll tell you one thing that having been good at sales is a exploration of your own emotional intelligence you know, people that are really good at it they know how to be vulnerable they know how to fail you know they've had they've been challenged you know we've all been abused whether openly or or um subtly by customers you know you certainly have uh, more often than not people who look down on the profession uh, because they've had a horrible experience somewhere in their life and so you have to be able to get past all of that. You believe in yourself. You have to have a sincere belief that your product can help mm-hmm. and, and do that in the face of a, an organization that doesn't agree with you or uh, is being told by someone else a different story. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, things to juggle and to be good at it. You, you need to have a mindset that a, you can win at this, but B, you have to really believe and get your emotional intelligence in check. And, and the, the people that don't that are not successful over the long term. Mm. And it's really interesting that you use the phraseology of a trade. I guess I'd seen it probably more as an art. Is there a difference in the way you perceive that? 
Yeah, I think people talk a lot about art versus science mm. um, versus trade. You know, if it's a, a trade is something you have to do a lot to be good at. Mm. Whereas I, you know, not being a scientist at all, you know, it's it's learning the mathematics, it's learning the the equations that make that work, and you can certainly get a lot of academic learning around the sales profession, but. I mean, it's like explaining someone how to ride a bike. You know, you can talk to them about it, but unless you've felt it for yourself, you don't, um, you just got to practice it. And and that's the thing about about selling. It's it's so nuanced because it's about individual people. You know, what works for you and I will not work for the next person. And uh, yeah, we all like to be right about things, but as a good salesperson, you need to learn that that uh, you're more often than not wrong and you've got to listen to someone else's point of view. This is, these are just good grown up skills to learn, right? Mm. And you've, you obviously play the long game too in terms of that, because the deal where we met was already two years in the making and uh, from start to a hundred million dollar plus uh, finish, it all stemmed from your thinking about the problem differently, your ability to excite others into doing things differently. Can you elaborate a little bit about your achievements on that particular project, getting that across the line? Yeah, I can only give you my point of view, right? So I don't think the customer has ever openly and honestly talked about their reasoning behind uh, selecting us in that tender, but I got a, I've got a pretty good sense. You know, I think I, you know, I've always taken the view that the customer experience comes first and I think so in this case, was it the customer experience as in the carrier or the customer's customer experience or a combination yeah, of both? That's a great question. So I think the mistake that uh, that my competition made was they were thinking the customer was, in this case, NBN. I, I, I don't think that was the case. I think the customer was who they wanted to target. I don't think I'm giving away any trade secrets by suggesting that you know, as a government-owned entity, NBN isn't great at working with their customers. You know, they're, they're a huge organisation, you know, heavily controlled by government. You know, they are, they're, they're controlled by, by ministers and, and public opinion. So you know, they are operating in an environment that is very unique to them. You know, they're in a market of one. So that's a lot of pressure. And in the middle of all that, it's very difficult to, to build a culture of of customer intimacy, of being really agile and responsive to customer demands, like their customer, the enterprise mm-hmm. industry in this case. But that's something that, that's an industry that Speedcast knew intimately well. And so, yeah, our approach from the get-go was, yeah, this is what we think the customer wants from a product like this. And, and we did our best to share that throughout the process, you know, without giving away any secrets. And you know, I think that that underlying theme permeated through the, the project. It was certainly when we were bidding it and we did our best to retain it during the delivery of it as well. Naturally, we had to had to demonstrate that technically we could deliver it. Uh, I don't know if that was our strength in the various offers, but we got the, I think we, we came together with a really good product. We had a good view of what the marketplace looked like. And I think we were probably the best at, at articulating that to MBN. Mm-hmm. And it was in articulating that you've effectively created a massive project. Could you estimate how many roles you might have created? And I guess you uh, also created a brand new OSSB assist to boot. Yeah, man. So I've got to tell you, I uh, <laughs> you know, I had trouble spelling OSSB assist before this program. But, <laughs> Me um, too. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we so we, we did. And naturally, we should talk about OSSB assist because my understanding of that group of a family of products has changed completely in the value of it. So, yeah, we, I think we got to you know, maybe at our peak 50 people, something like that, combination of permanent and contract staff, a lot of program entities, a lot of there's a lot of governance involved, as you can imagine, working with a government company. And then there's just a lot of engineering work, a lot of management of subcontractors and a program that literally did not stop the pressure um, from the second that we signed it to the, uh, to today, it's, I mean, it's still in operation now. It, it does not, it hasn't stopped at all. Mm. So it, um, yeah, it was a real learning experience. I don't think just for us. I think I think even NBN had some misunderstandings on on what was involved in the program. So everybody learned out of it. Now I don't think anybody could look back on it and say it wasn't a learning experience. Mm. 
And pretty amazing. I, I see that as a massive achievement, the creation of 50 roles, but also the learning, the product that came out of it that effectively came about because of your way of being able to, to conceptualise the idea and then pitch it to and excite people about it. Yeah, th- thanks, mate. I, um, th- it was a convergence of a lot of really good ideas at a good moment in time in this satellite industry. So there were some technologies that were changing in the sense that satellites traditionally would sell their radio freq- their spectrum to a company like Speedcast who would convert that into IP and then sell that as a managed service to customers. And they could do that because of the way the satellite was designed in part. But the satellite technology had evolved. Spectrum was harder to get their hand on. Bandwidth requirements were increasing. And, and really, it's, it made a lot more sense for the satellite owner and operator to be the one that delivered that managed service. And so companies around the world were starting to do that. But you know, satellite companies, the companies that build and operate satellites, are typically product leaders. So they are very engineering-led. Um, you know, these companies might have one or two salespeople in the entire world, you know, for a, a multi-billion dollar business because it doesn't need a lot of salespeople. You, know, you need people who can deal with with the sea level of a customer. But at the end of the day, it's, a, it's an engineering discussion. Mm. And yet they needed to, to pivot and become organizations that intimately understood enterprise, understood how to deliver service to customers. It's a massive shift. And so, uh, you know, NPN were doing something pioneering. They they identified that, yes, they needed to deliver a managed service into the marketplace, but what they'd done already and other companies in the world had done is, you know, from a satellite world, it's the difference between delivering radio frequency into the market or or IP into the market or internet. And, like, that's not the be-all and end-all of a service. You know, service is a particular experience. So there's so much more to that. And the product manager at MBN, P, had realised that. So he was um, certainly a pioneer. He retired after this program, which is a shame. But yeah, you know, he was a pioneer in understanding that there has to be a whole stack of of services, and the things that glued this together was this OSS BSS layer. You know, if we could nail the OSS BSS, then then companies like Vocus, like Telstra, like Optus, like like companies who were t- who were telcos who wanted to deliver some really agile and flexible services to their customers could plug into an OSS BSS and could access a range of satellite services that were really flexible, that theoretically could be modified and made personal to that particular organization. So, yeah, and it was OSS and BSS that glued that together. And I guess you also touched on the fact that it was delivering IP, but also the world was changing for the way that the, the services that were hanging on the end, utilising the IP stream, such as servicing the mining industry you talked about, but also the uh, cruise ship industry, which obviously is challenged now, but all these yeah. other things that hung on the end of it that all had different requirements for the IP stream. I mean, you you nailed it in one. There's just a lot of things that that were happening at once. That in NBN were doing something that no one else in the world had ever done. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, more companies are doing it now, like the low Earth orbit operator, the constellations like Starlink and Telesat, yeah, they're coming into the marketplace now and and they're really thinking about OSS BSS. And they're really mm. thinking about you know, how do they provide an interface for organisations to access all this capability without having to have the technical resources in there, you know, to kind of do it in the way they normally do business as a telco. But NBN was doing it for the first time. So, you know what, you're not going to nail it the first time around. Yeah, I guess it really was. The focus was on being a, a managed telco service deal. But what do you think was the about the OSS BSS that made it the critical component you just described? Do you know, um, you'll have to tell me if this is typical of big OSS BSS projects, but my view of it was it was the first single pane of glass to the entire customer life cycle. You know, the idea that you could qualify a service convert that qualified service into a, an activation process, convert that activation process into a into actual delivered service, and then you could report against and provide support on that service over time. So you could manage the life of that service before it even happened through a single interface, you know, an OSS BSS portal. And then behind the scenes, there was so much, well, there is so much smarts to make those what should be seemingly 
simple activities um, come together. So, so yeah, the bit that you know, I learned about is, <laughs> you know, what happens for that customer or the user, which should be simple, you know, can I get a service in this area and how much is it going to be? Um, mm-hmm. Yes, I like it. Can I convert that into it? How do I order it? So then you place an order. So these are simple things. <laughs> mm-hmm. But before, behind the scenes, it just boggled my mind how much activity and mm-hmm. interfaces had to happen to make what was seemingly a simple task. Mm-hmm. And there's so many different additional extra layers to, I guess, that life cycle as well that you don't necessarily think of until you sit down and really plan it out methodically. So, yeah, place an order. Yes, get a bill. Um, maybe decommission the service or make some changes. And it sounds pretty simple that there's a lot more even to the front end, but then even more in the back end of the processes and variations that the OSS BSS has to handle. Yeah. And so, I mean, you tell me, is, is it typical of a of a uh, an OSS BSS implementation or is it a, do you think it's, a, it's aspirational for an implementation to do all those uh, things? So I guess there's so many different facets, so many different customer types. So there's definitely a lot of customer portals out there for sure. Uh, a lot of OSS BSS are built more for internal purposes and then you've got IT delivering customer portals. You've got managed service offerings, which sometimes do have the customized portals and the customized processes like ITSM, ITIL. Um, so there's a number of different variants. It, uh, I think a lot of times uh, we build the, the OSS, particularly for the operations team that necessarily look beyond. So how does it impact the customers? How does it impact the business that we're servicing as in our own internal business? How can we help marketing? How can we help the exec team? So I'm not sure that there's a, a single answer to that. And that's what potentially makes OSS BSS such challenging projects as well. So was that your first uh, experience dealing with OSS BSS? Yeah, of that scale, yes. So uh, before that, we'd use products uh, at Speedcast, like ServiceNow, you know, we're kind of commercial off the shelf products to manage our internal operations yeah, mm-hmm. and, they're great, and they're great products. But this idea of integrating, you know, a single workflow between customer portal and backend operations, mm-hmm. that was the first time I, I'd ever seen it. And the more people I talk to, it's not a very common implementation of, of software where they can mm-hmm. do the whole thing end to end and it works seamlessly. Yeah, it's certainly one of the things, in my experience, one of the things that the carriers have a challenge with is, particularly for the really big managed service, so we're talking 100 million plus there, and we've worked on some that have been over the billion dollar managed service type offerings. And for them, there is that kind of portal, and often it's customised. And to an extent, I'm a little surprised that there's not more of a, a cookie cutter nature to it, that some of these big telcos do many, many of these managed service deals, and yet so many of the OSS look vastly different from customer to customer. And they definitely need to be customised because each customer is a special snowflake. They need their own um, certain features. But I'm a little bit surprised that there's not more of a cookie-cutter approach taken by the the big telcos to do that. Do you know, I I think (laughs) that that might be partly to blame to you know, good quality salespeople. You know, the, the, you know, part of the problem is, you know, the more you try and customize a product to a customer, obviously, it, number one, it becomes more expensive to them, becomes mm. super sticky. They can't move away from it because mm-hmm. they've had to modify something that's come off the shelf so much that you know, they're scared to do it again with a new vendor. That means the vendor has to charge more for the product because mm-hmm. they can't sell it again. Yeah, you know, so the industry is kind of self, you know, it eats itself. In that regard, and, and I'm like you. I, I think well, why wouldn't you have a web service, you know, that used better practices and said, look, if you wanted to create a business around this, um, and you followed these steps, you know, forget about doing it your way, do it our way, but it'll get you 80% of the way there, and then mm. you know, the, the 20% can be your secret sauce. Yeah, you know, there's probably those sort of things in software that manages gyms and software that manages personal training and things that are outside of technology. You know, they they ask you to follow their system. They don't want to personalize themselves to follow yours. Mm. Yeah, really interesting. And so following that project, you became really, really familiar with OSS BSS. You became responsible for implementation of the project. 
and that required stand up of the managed service itself, the OSS, BSS, the team, the ops, the processes, stakeholders, and so much more. It must have been a real challenge for you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so that was an understatement. I don't, I, I don't know what the what a bigger word than challenge is, but uh, <laughs> uh, it was uh, it was out of control. So that it would I would say I've never been tested professionally more in my life, and uh, yeah, but nothing good comes out of not being tested. So mm. uh, yeah, we we got through. It. Everybody on the program learned something about themselves, good or bad. I'm just proud that that. Uh, you know, I didn't give up. The team we had didn't give up. When you say I was responsible for, I was certainly part of a team that was responsible for it. So, you know, we had some really strong technical uh, people. So the person that, you know, was involved in the program, you know, the kind of lead engineer in the program that ended up taking over the OSS BSS, you know, a mutual friend of ours, he, um, yeah, he just didn't give up. You know, when he was in the, he was in the face of what I thought was insurmountable problems, he did not give up. And uh, yeah, interestingly, both him and I were doing an MBA during the, this program, and and uh, you yeah, didn't we were, have enough on your plate already. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was Matt. Well, both of us were doing an MBA, and we both had kids during it all, uh-huh. and, <laughs> and we're doing this program. So uh, let's just say that we're reasonably we've proven that we're a bit resilient throughout yeah, all this. Yeah. Um, so you had your, your black belt in martial arts and now you've got the black belt in OSS the, <laughs> going through all the bouts and challenges that you did. Um, did you uncover any pitfalls or surprises in amongst that? Or yeah. How long was that list? Yeah, I mean, so, you, you know, pitfalls, surprise. number one, you're experts in hindsight, right? But, you know, what I what I learned from, what I was warned about getting into this was be careful of asking for too many people's opinions because not everyone's an expert, even though they present themselves to be. And so this idea of doing requirements gathering by just asking everybody what they want, putting it into a list and then saying that's a requirement, that's a mistake. And I'm probably telling you something that's bleedingly obvious, but, you know, on our side and our customer side, I think that's what happened. You know, I think they interviewed a bunch of stakeholders and said, not what do you have now and what could make it better, but not even that. I think they said, what do you want? Mm. And then we'll make that the requirement. That's very open-ended, yeah. Oh, and, but what ends up happening is, you know, where you can achieve a result from one field, it takes 10 because mm. 10 different people wanted a little bit different information or it's, they want it to be referenced as something a little bit different or formatted because they, they're, they're too engrossed in how they do things today. And again, this is this is basic stuff. But in hindsight, you go, yes. If I would have asked you, this is the answer I would have told you. But in the when you get you're in the middle of it of a program that's so complicated, you lose sight of the forest. And mm. and the thing that I think a lot of people lost sight of was was that customer. We're saying, mm. oh, we, you know, we're building a really complex system. How does this add value to the customer experience? The person at the end of the line, you know, who's qualifying that service, because that's all it needed to do. Nobody ever argued the fact we need to qualify a service, we need to convert it you know, into a service through you know, a whole bunch of activation. That's got to, mm. that's got to order some things. Um, and then we've got to support it afterwards. So pretty simple at a high level. And so the question, I think what should have, we should have had at every meeting was you know, a paragraph or a sentence that summarized what we're here for, you know, the mm. business case, what the, what the commander's intent was. And we didn't do that. And it got lost until we got to the end of it. And we had a product that did what it wanted to do, but it was so complicated that I think the person that we were trying to sell it to didn't enjoy the experience, you know, mm. which you kind of lost its value. But everyone was right, you know. So, you know, that's that, you know, it was certainly an exercise in leadership and you know, having to have strong personalities to convince. And all that's not unique to this project. So um, I could go down that path for a long time, but the, the, I guess the biggest lesson for me, specifically around OSS BSS, was you know, just don't forget what we're there for. And then in hindsight, geez, there was don't forget what scale you're talking about. You know, I think I think um, this product was built to handle ten thousand customers, but it was never going to have that many. You know, it was only ever going to have a, a handful of customers who then had many customers. Mm. So you know the the level of automation that was expected of the product, which which took a lot of time, money, effort, and inso- you know, kind of attention, 
when you might order 10 services that look like that. You just didn't need it. You know, I think mm. you introduced me to the idea of this, of a mechanical Turk. And I'm not sure if you've explained what that is, but I, I love the concept. And so you know, that, that idea of, you know, I think we call it a swivel chair now, you know, the idea of just taking a, a, uh, a ticket for anything else, go and manually do it, and then producing it, it's done. That would have been a cheaper and easier way and certainly more flexible way to deliver a lot of the capability in the product. Yeah, really valid point. And automation is a real buzzword in our industry. And oftentimes it's not really not really justified in, uh, in having to go to the expense of an automation. So it might be a task that uh, you do once a month and it maybe takes an extra hour to do. So you could automate an hour away. But if you're only doing it once a month and it's only saving you $100, building the automation is probably going to cost 10000 So it's just not really justified in doing it. Um, so, yeah, it's one of the things I found really interesting about that project is that the level of automation possibly wasn't justified, particularly in the early stages until volumes really ramped up significantly. So, yeah, I always take the perspective of trying to iron out all the problems with an automation by doing it manually a lot initially and then looking to automate it. But it's interesting too, the requirement gathering that you talked about. I uh, follow a concept that Seth Godin introduced called thrashing, which is basically getting everybody's ideas down on the table in the early, early stages of the project. So everybody feels like they're being heard and that simplifies the change management process further down the track if people feel like they're being heard and their ideas are being aired. But then it's also a take that thrashing process, take all those ideas, consolidate them, build them back towards the commander's intent and then look to really minimise the number of changes along the evolution of the project. Uh, it becomes really difficult if you're still capturing requirements halfway through, 75% of the way through a project. I'm not sure if that was happening with you, but certainly if the, the requirements are changing, it makes it really challenging. We all have to adapt because things change anyway, but uh, if you're still picking up new requirements along the way, it makes it difficult. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, the sense I get, Ryan, is nobody's worked out the perfect way to do it. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, everybody, everybody's still trying to, you know, take experiences from previous projects and say this is the way it's got to be done because it worked mm. for me once mm -hmm. yeah in hindsight it would have been wonderful to you know work out really this is the you know, these are the these are the must-have features and these are the nice to have features or this is the catalyst that's going to trigger this capability mm. but again it's just the, the, the environment was such because it's a government entity trying to build a commercial product that's it's kind of a you know it's a immovable object meeting with an unstoppable force. <laughs> it was just never going to, you know, it was just, it was, if you looked at it on paper, it's, yeah, it's doomed to be a challenge. You know, it's, it's working now and, and, you know, I'm very happy to say that the end customers who purchase the product are very happy, but there's certainly a lot of processes that could be improved. Oh, there always is. And particularly if one's for that size that you're covering the whole of the Australian population, well, a subset of it that's getting uh, satellite services, but the whole of the Australian environment. So a customer portal was a really big part of that OSS BSS solution. Did yeah. your earlier experiences developing websites and having a real customer involvement uh, with satellite customers really provide any insights into the user experience development on that project? Uh, you know, I really thought that it would but I realized pretty quickly how much the world had changed. Mm. You know, it's, it's something I mentioned earlier. It's what I don't understand is that you can have intuitive interf interfaces and mm. um, you know, very early on, I think we, you know, I was involved in the building uh, industry for, for hotels very early before the kind of online accommodation industry kicked off. And we spent a lot of time trying to track what people do on a screen you know, what do they want to enter first how quickly do they want to place an order what point should they enter in their their personal details and their credit card details to place it? those sort of things just getting what that experience is on a website should look like and yeah, i think that was really helpful for coming up with the concept for this but it became obvious very quickly that there were some experts who understood that and the thing i mentioned earlier that 
just because the interface interface is simple doesn't mean the things that have to happen behind it are. And mm. um, you know, I, I you know, this idea of a mechanical Turk. You know, maybe you want to just explain what where that where that commentary came from. Yeah, absolutely. So mechanical Turk was a concept of hundreds of years ago. There was uh, this box that uh, was basically allowed. Uh, a person to play a game of chess against what looked like just an automaton, uh, a box that was able to, to move the chess pieces around by themselves. But what was actually sitting behind it was there was a chess master that was actually sitting inside the box making it look like it was some sort of a robot. And people believed for a long, long time that they were playing against this amazing, amazingly talented robot. Uh, but the paradigm for OSS is that uh, you can have an interface on the outside that looks like one thing, which can be really look like it's real automation, bright and shiny, and the customer's experience of it is that it's really highly automated. But behind the scenes, there's actual manual processing to get the same job done and to give the same user experience to the customers. And in many cases that, yeah, as we mentioned earlier on, it, Holds true in the OSS industry. There are many things that can be automated, but not everything should be automated, uh, depending on volumes, benefits, all the, that sort of financial stuff. Whereas I think sometimes we take on the technical challenge and, and say, oh, this is a great problem to solve, let's automate it. But it's not always justified. And I think particularly in that project, the, the mechanical Turk concept was fairly important because it was highly complex uh, back-end processing, uh, relatively simple front-end uh, lifecycle stuff, but also not necessarily the volumes to support full automation. Well, I can tell you that, you know, sometimes you, uh, you know, in life when you're working with customers or people, you you make a statement or you throw a comment out and it sticks. Mm. And uh, that comment you made in a few of our early meetings, that's, that's stuck. And it landed with a lot of the engineering team on both on us as a supplier and and uh, and on our customer side. And again, here's another great thing: is we all knew that that theory made sense. You know, why do we have to get a computer to do it when we can get a person to do it? Like let's let's challenge that thinking along the way. And it got lost. We all thought it was a good idea, <laughs> but we never really did it. And uh, so yeah. In hindsight, we're experts, but that's something that uh, that you know we should have. Somebody should have been tracking. Yeah, you know, here's a good ideas register. Um, let's see how we can incorporate that into the program once we're off. Mm. But but it got lost. Uh, you know, I think it got lost in the world of high level procurement. You know, it doesn't matter what everyone thinks and what everyone likes. We have a document here that has mm. a set of requirements, and yeah, you know, before we pay you, you need to address these requirements, even though nobody really wants them. Mm. And uh, yeah, managing by contractors, I found always to be a, a real struggle. So yes, it's important, but the perception of what was written into that contract and the realities of what's delivered in something so complex as OSS implementation uh, can be a real challenge. I've never really seen management by contract working well. Right. Uh, so I was going to ask, where have you seen it work? So there you go, it hasn't, but it, it remains to be done because I think it at a, at a management level probably is done because it holds people to account. You know, at the yep. end of the day, how else do you say you've delivered this this product yep. um, and that we're getting the value that we thought we were going to get out of it? Yeah. So, so what's a better way to do it, do you think? So I guess in saying too, in saying management by contract, it definitely the overarching principles you stick to. Uh, but if you're doing it on a clause-by-clause clause basis, and I tend to find that it only falls into management by contract clause-by-clause, clause, when the project, when certain stakeholders or, or people involved feel like it's running off the rails of their expectations. So I think that the better project managers that I've seen that handle it is ones who are more pragmatic and, and manage towards an outcome, that they can all find a, a common understanding of what the outcomes are uh, because the contract managing by clauses, I haven't personally seen it work at all. Wow. Awesome, but it still gets done. Yeah, correct. And and it does provide pragmatism from both sides. So from the the people who are building it and the people who are accepting it. 
Uh, there needs to be pragmatism about what's actually going to work. And so do you think then, you know, in hindsight, this, a smarter way to do things is work out who you want as a partner. You could still theoretically agree on a set of high level requirements and a budget, but then understand, but then clearly define the experience versus the task or like what's, this, yeah. what's the, what's the better practice here? So one of the things I've found has worked a little more successfully for me in recent years. So in the past, I used to run vendor selection processes driven a little bit more on function. So you come up with a set of requirements at the start. These days, I tend to take a more persona-driven approach. So who are the people? What do they need to achieve? And what are the activities that are most important? And with the, the functional requirement list, you end up with hundreds of requirements, some of which are just really not really going to move the needle for a company. Whereas when you take the persona and the, the high important activities and you really focus on delivering those, you get a lot closer to delivering an outcome that does move the needle. That's just my perspective, but... Oh, there's probably a million different ways of, of running it, but yeah, you know, I take much more of a persona driven approach these days. Yeah, right. So it's a really good segue. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in the tech that we lose sight of what the OSS is there really to support. You're a really big picture solution person. What's your take on OSS and VSS from um, your experiences on that project? Look, my uh, my view of it is. Again, if, you, if you're thinking about the customer and the customer is the person that's, that's paying for something at the, at the end of the value chain, not halfway through it, then, then I, don't, I don't think you can fail at it because and I can tell you now working in business and it's, it's rock, paper, customer, right? So if the customer says, what a great experience I'm having here, and even at an individual level, if people have had to work really hard to get that experience, it's very satisfying. You know, it, it helps you get up in the morning. It, it, it justifies the effort you put into your job when someone at the end of the, of the value chain says, oh, this is great. Like, this is awesome. Thank you so much for putting the effort in. It makes my life and, and my business more successful. Um, so you know, where I've seen OSS, BSS work really well when, when, number one, that feedback is fed back when it's a job well done. But number two, when that's not important, then it's just, it, yeah, it just doesn't happen. Like, you know, we don't invest money in doing things for the sake of doing it or doing it because it because it just keeps a person within that business happy as opposed to delivering a result for the customer. So, mm. you, you know, I, now where I'm at now, they they do have a um, obviously a very complex OSS, BSS implementation. But, yeah, and the portals they use and the the linkages they provide to our operational system from the customer portal it's very considered mm. you know that the, the, they don't sit there and say we want to give as much information as possible to our customer because you know what i've seen in other programs is too much information is could be as bad as not enough mm. it needs to be relevant information so that, that customer can kind of work out what quality is and, and just to make a comment you know in satellite you know, something we are we we struggled with for such a long time was how to articulate and quantify quality mm. it's, it's really hard because you want to sit there and say why and, you know, in telco it's even harder harder right like how do you say to a customer yeah we, we think you should pay a premium for our service because we're the best quality provider mm. and you know a customer especially with the world of mbn now a customer goes well hang on you're all just reselling an mbn product mm. what do i care you know if it's an outage all I care about is outage times. And if you're the offer the highest availability, then then you're probably the best service provider. But mm. yeah, that might be true because that's the thing that they can they can track and, and quantify. But things like support and things like billing accuracy, things like the time between a customer request and closure of their, that request, not just a ticket, you know, that's a problem, but you know, can you tell me how much it's going to be for a new service in this location. And if you can turn that around 24 hours versus two weeks, that's got to inform the overall experience. And so like in satellites, it's really hard to say how this is the highest quality. So what happens mm. over time when there's a lot of competition, it 
just becomes a differentiator on price. And mm-hmm. that happens in telco, right? It um, becomes the commodity service. It's hard to differentiate on quality. How do you define it? How do you measure it? it it's hard. It's, and, it, and because if you were to ask somebody, you know, in the procurement team, why'd you buy that company? They go, well, they were the cheapest and everything else was equal. Right, mm. like that—that's that's their that's their answer. Um, and, and we'll do the same. Like we'll go to the last page of a proposal and look at price. Mm. But when you're having a bad experience, no one goes in there and says, "Why are you having a bad experience?" Well, because they're the cheapest. Mm. Yeah, no one says, "Why is the best provider?" Well, they're the cheapest. That never happens. I say the best provider. Why is that? Because I get this great service experience, and they call me every Friday night, and they say I've had a good experience this week yeah, at, at mm. a minimum, or. You know, when I have a problem, well, they tell me before a problem is going to happen. They inform me while the problem is happening and they tell me when it's going to get fixed they, and it's fixed on time, you mm. know, or, you know, whatever it is that helps them perform their business. And uh, yeah, so, you know, I think our good implementations of OSS, BSS do all those things. You know, they, they help a service provider deliver a quality service over a really cheap one. That's, mm. and that, again, that's from my really humble experience working with, yeah, a couple of enter- enterprise companies. And again, looking from almost being from the outside looking in, what do you see the really big opportunities? Again, are they tied to the service, uh, the delivery? Do you mean in satellite or in OSS BSS? Uh, probably more OSS BSS. What are the opportunities for us to do it better than, uh, than we do at the moment? Because as much as I love the amazing things that we've already done in the industry, I still feel like we've got so far to go. There's opportunities in all directions, but I'd love to see you as a, the outsider looking in to an extent. What are those big opportunities for us to, to solve? Yeah, do you know, I think you said it before. It's, do you know, not, uh, it's, it's kind of knowing what good looks like, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, I know there's, you know, things like TM Forum and there's there's so many associations of industry bodies that that try and define what you know best or better practice looks like but then realistically you know, a lot of those better practices are you know, come down to a to a certification or a standard or a compliance thing right i, I don't see anybody you know we, we did a fair bit of evaluation of different oss bss products who's who can say look if if you buy this product from us this will get you 80 percent there and mm-hmm. it, it, this provides you a whole bunch of modules that you can roll in or out. So you can move from the, the manual activity through to the automated activity really easily. You just pay an additional service fee or a license fee to do that. Like that sort of thing that you're talking about where you could get a really consistent experience. So, you know, you ex- this is what you expect. It's a consistent you know, user interface. And, you know, my view is that, if you get this right, certainly in telco and satellite. Like, so if you get it right and you're a telco, for example, and like Dodo did this for a while ago where they said, we own a customer's bill. So what else can we put on that bill? So they mm-hmm. started doing power, mm-hmm. you know, the utilities. A, a great idea. So I think using the same concept is if you own a portal, what else could you supply in that portal that supports a particular experience for them? So if it's communications, mm-hmm. What other things are there? there? Can you run field services in that in same portal? Could you do warehousing and distribution in that same portal? You know, it's 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 how much could you broaden the the um, responsibility of the OSS BSS system so that you deliver a single experience to a customer, but you you might and you might have a single prime supplier to that customer, but underneath that you could have a whole bunch of products and services and suppliers that fit into a single kind of buying process mm. that'd be the utopia but i'm sure that's what everyone's trying to get to <laughs> exactly so you've now moved into a, a big game hunting role with focus the possibilities of os are still in your thoughts there yeah very much so you know my focus is an infrastructure company amongst many things it's a lot of brands but it you know it owns you know the kind of biggest I guess self-built network in the country. I think I think it's thirty plus thousand kilometers of, of fiber. Um, that includes some subsea fiber, fiber across this country, fiber in New Zealand. So, you know, it's 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 growing aggressively. It's doing it. It's doing it right. So it's got its fiber business, and it and it has a lot of 
highly secure networks for defence and government and so forth. It also has some other brands. So, you know, it owns um, some SME um, and consumer brands in Dodo. So it has a really good access to a range of different customers. And so, you know, I sit in the in a group within the business called Strategic Projects and you know, we're trying to predict technology that's, that's um, going to be attractive uh, to our various levels of customer in the medium term future and, and, and try and bring this together. So the idea of OSS BSS, you know, if, if we have an indiv- a single view for our customers into our business, and then we can roll in different products and services that are complementary. you know, we're not selling hammers and nails and internet at the same time, you know, it's, it's, it's something that all makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's the bit that we're involved in now. So OSS BSS as a concept is um is really important to us and we also have it as a as a value add to some of our um our government customers we've got a we've got a bespoke discrete network for them and, and we offer a whole bunch of portals and insights that we can personalize to you know various contract obligations it's you know, it's it's really cool so we talk about that idea of how do you define quality you know i think they've done a very good a good um they've built a very good example of that and I guess looking back, looking forward, so back in the early 2000s, you had the, the business where you were uh, providing sales support for techs or for technology type companies uh, with Red A Solutions. Do you still maintain that entrepreneurial spirit or have you now, now that you've been in big business, become more of that entrepreneurial spirit and really driving bigger change through bigger organisations or do you still harbour that entrepreneurial spirit too? So, uh, <laughs> I mean, I would think I do. You know, that's the bit that I, I like because being an entrepreneur is, is you know, seeing, it, is seeing a a big empty block of land and working out what mm-hmm. you can build on it right and but more so not just building it if you're building a hotel how do you get residents in that hotel mm-hmm. residents in that apartment block how do you sustain it how do you maintain it over time so yeah you know, i think as i've gotten older and and you know you have kids and you and you start thinking a little bit longer term in your in your own life that same mindset has applied to my projects and as a result i'm thinking bigger right mm-hmm. you do that when you when you do deals of the size that I've been fortunate enough to do. So yeah, look, absolutely the entrepreneurial spirit is there, but yeah, as a, you know, we're, as a company, we're a challenger. So, you know, we're, we're about growth. You know, some of our competitors have hit their tipping point. They've hit critical mm-hmm. mass in the amount of customers that they can get. And so yeah, they're, they're worried more about how do they defend their market mm-hmm. and how do they reduce costs? That's, that's not a great environment to live in. Mm-hmm. And being on, you know, it requires a different type of entrepreneur to identify savings. Yes, you need some creativity to do that. But, you know, the business I'm in is how do we grow efficiently? How do we find opportunities that maybe weren't there before? Um, you know, you've heard this concept of blue ocean and red ocean. So how, how do you, within a marketplace, it seems pretty well defined. How do you find blue ocean opportunities in there? Yeah. And that is, that's just running a business. You know, that's, that's going back to those basics that we had when we're running our own company, it's you have to, have to think about cash flow, you have to think about resources, mm. but you need to be able to ask questions of customers that maybe other people aren't asking them. You know, maybe they're a little bit more intimate than they used to, but it gets to the core of what they're trying to achieve. And um, and you know, once you can share and be vulnerable with each other, then then you can partner on building something together. So that's yeah, I, it's something that I that I really enjoy. It's something that gets me out of bed in the morning, and um, and Luckily, I found some companies that were happy to pay me to do it. Brilliant. And it was really interesting that you referred to the Blue Ocean Strategy there. It's a, it's a book that is probably 30 years old now, but there's the, certainly tenants of it that, uh, that I see we use in some of my methodologies. Have you got certain approaches on how to tackle that big game hunting, the, uh, yeah, the, the kind of looking for Blue Ocean opportunities? Yeah, so I do, and I think, you know, I, could, I definitely I've got some complex ideas, but like most, like most things in life, it's the, the, my ideas are simple, not easy. You know, like mm. the good things are simple, not easy. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, when you go to when you do a marketing course, they say, you know, the art of marketing is simple. You find out what a customer wants and you sell it to them. Mm. That's marketing, which is true, right? But that's not what anyone does. <laughs> they <laughs> they build a product they think a customer wants mm-hmm. and then tries to convince them that they want it. 
right? I know I failed from that uh, that perspective for sure. <laughs> right. So, so you know that. So you know, I think that principle of of like just being fanatical about listening to the voice of a customer when you're developing mm. products. Yeah, that's the bit that I have to keep checking myself mm. yeah, because like I said, like, you know, I and the people I work with and, you know, everyone, and we love technology and we love when we've got a cool thing trying to convince people that it's cool. And so, yeah, sometimes you introduce the thing that you built and you go, ta-da, and, you know, <laughs> a big smile on your face. The customer's looking there going, I'm not sure what I'm looking at, right? Like, so you have to be really careful that that you never stop relating you know, what it is that you're talking about, what it is you got, what is your offering to something that's important to to a market or an individual customer and and make everything personal. So, yeah. you know, going back to that, yeah, yes, I, I there's a there's a great book called The Challenger Sale, which you know, I think it's mm. it, I think that's a um a book that needs to be read by every sales professional, helps them define the type of person they are, but mm. also yeah, how do you keep you know constantly questioning your customer? But mm. it's and it's challenging them making sure they, they really understand what it is that they think they want. So, yeah, that's that's one area. But, you know, I read this book a while ago called Good to Great, and that's been another mm-hmm. one that's been around for probably 20 years. Uh, it, again, the principles in that book hasn't, haven't changed at all. So, you know, if, if you want to, uh, you know, read somewhere, if you want to be, if you want to come up with a new idea, read history. So, mm. um, you know, it's just coming up with with just understanding that kind of nature of, of commerce and, 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 again, goes back to what I said earlier, just – what makes people tick and just keep things simple. Mm. So you talked about it being a great book for salespeople, but do you feel like it would be something really valuable for the tech people to, to read as well and really understand what drives further, much further upstream from them, the projects that they actually get to work on? Yeah. Yep. So the quick answer is 100%. It would be, it would be amazing if people who led engineering had a, better appreciation of sales. I don't mean leaders in a C-level person, but I mean person that leaves that leads small teams mm. because you know, they can influence everybody else because it's an appreciation. And I've been guilty myself of taking an opportunity, putting it together, gluing together what I think with what I thought we, we delivered as a company, throwing it over my shoulder into the engineering team and go, here, go deliver it. And they're saying, what on earth have you just done? Mm. And uh, you know you, you you only make that mistake a couple of times because you lose a lot of friends in your business. But uh, <laughs> you know that's uh, and, and so that what that develops is, is just attention, right? And saying, you know, and that's where engineers kind of develop a a uh, distrust of salespeople, and it works in a reverse. Salespeople who you know they get a sense like, I oh, know we can do this. It sounds and feels a bit like a program we've done before. Why aren't we delivering it with, at the same quality as we have? Mm. And it's because it's a real inherent lack of understanding of each other. So, you know, I do think there's a lot of uh, books out there on selling. Like I said, I think Challenger Sale is probably the better of them all. But but what it doesn't talk about is that, that talks about some of the high-level concepts you know, had behave as a salesperson. It doesn't tell you how to be a salesperson, mm-hmm. you know, somebody that's involved in business development. Because, you know, how to be a salesperson is, you know, I guess getting all that emotional stuff right, being able to plan your week being able to understand how to develop pipeline you know Mm. it's and forecasting you know this is you know every job i've ever had in my life my forecast balls up into a board report so (laughs) right and and along the way people add color to it right so you know it so you have to hopefully not a whole bunch of red right yeah so you know normally it's 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 changing the weighting of certain deals, but the truth is that you know, and I and I learned this running my own business. I learned this running sales team is you you need to respect and honour the salesperson's opinions about the likelihood of closing business. Now they might have a low opinion because they don't have the experience on understand how to convert it, you know. And it's the same on the other side. They might have a high opinion because they haven't looked for things that really should be red flags in that opportunity. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think your job as a leader there is to be able to challenge it. Now, if an engineering person, because it's this is very engineering like, you know, it's 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 being able to it's find quite scientific. It's quite scientific, right? So, you know, where I've seen it work really well is when engineers go through a similar training course mm-hmm. on sales. So, not so they can have the answers or can guide a salesperson on how to do it, but 
just so they can ask the right questions. Have you thought about this? Because all of us get ahead of ourselves. You know, we have oh, even just taking it out of the the tech, so having the tech blinkers on and taking it to a more customer centric. So what are we doing for the customer? Um, so Challenger Sales, is that the kind of book that us mere mortals, a dummy's guide as it were, that we could in the tech industry could readily consume and, and really understand the uh, the ideas, the, the main concepts behind um, developing markets? Yeah, I think that's a concept about developing opportunities. Mm. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, I just think there's probably a, there's probably a, book list in fact i could probably send you a book list that you uh, can maybe add we've got some show notes show notes yep yes yeah, there's probably a handful of books that provide a good insight into the way you know a company operates a way you should be asking questions to the company but then also how you should be structuring your day as a professional Do you know and i think that's the the thing that most people don't understand um of if you're not an external looking at the sales job is is you see salespeople who close deals yes mm -hmm. and then the, they're the big one you, what you haven't seen is the amount of work that goes into that happening mm -hmm. and also you have to remember someone has to come second somebody told me a long time ago an old boss you feel sorry for the person that comes second so you only ever want to come first or last because the person mm -hmm. that comes second has put an equal amount of effort in for no return mm -hmm. and everyone's been in that position and so you know you have to get out of second spot um and so I think conversely, though, is is having a good insight into how the engineering team works. And, mm -hmm. and that's a tough one because you talked about earlier about this concept of Rainmaker. I don't know if I like the term, but it's, it's really, it is chasing big deals. And whenever you chase big deals like that, you're always, you always have to stretch the capability of the company that you're with, right? And so if you just relied on feedback from the company in them telling you what can you do, that's not always going to be what they could do. It's what they do do today. And so you need to, you need to have a good sense of what's possible, you know, be a bit creative, but not, not selling something that isn't too far of a stretch for the company you work with. And so that's, that's another hard understanding to have. And so as a good salesperson, you need to be able to ask the same questions in reverse of the team behind you. Not, you know, what would you, it should be questions like, what would you like to do? Not what do you do today? Mm -hmm. And it's clearly come through during the podcast today that you have an incredible positive energy, probably more so than just about anybody else I know in the, in the industry. So after 20 years in this game, uh, what still inspires and excites you? Mate, you know what? It's you. Like, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it, it, what it gets me is in technology and, and I haven't seen it anywhere else, You can you can find people who – have had a career in it and who still are just fans of, of it. Mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, my dad was a lifetime accountant. Yeah. It got very high with CFO business runner, but yeah, <laughs> I don't think he loved it. You know, I don't mm -hmm. think he was still, you know, going like a first year uni student at the end of his career, but I've, I've known many people who are at the end of their career and they're just as excited about the technology now. And um, so, you know, I get, I, you know, I get to work with, I'm very fortunate, we work with, with some very kind of leading edge space and satellite technology companies and they, uh, you know, they're enthusiastic. And as I get older, you know, early 40s, I, I love seeing a 25-year-old get enthusiastic and passionate about something and being able to hopefully shape their career, mm. no, mostly by telling them about mistakes I made, not about things I've done well. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, and th that's awesome because then you, you you're paying it forward. You, it gives you a warm and fuzzy that maybe you've learned something in your professional career. Mm. But then, you know, also I've recently moved into a team where I'm the least capable person in that room. There's some amazingly talented people that I work with, and so I'm challenged. I feel like I'm I'm starting something new again, and I'm challenged, and I'm been given autonomy, and so. I think I think reinventing yourself over time that, that's another thing that that uh, that inspires me. Yeah, I wonder whether it's also the ability to see the big picture as well. Getting that broader vision, getting that bigger picture view, and the the out of the possible. Because I know 
early in my career, it was all about the tech blinkers were on and I didn't really look beyond the, the tech problems I was solving. Whereas now I get to see the opportunities like you talked about Starlink and these other things that are coming through that are just incredibly exciting, revolutionary for the industry, but how to, how to impact that. I guess I never, never would have looked at that early in my career. Yeah, you're right. So, yes, you're right. Um, yeah, but I think as we all get a little bit older, we are also get a little bit more excited about the simple things. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at your kids and you see that they, they're so enthusiastic because they've learned how to spell. Mm-hmm. You know, they can, they, they've learned a new way to communicate with you and it's writing. Like it's a simple basic thing that we take for granted, right? And so my experience and certainly a lot of experiences of people around me is that it's, it's a lot of those simple things you, you acknowledge what, how important they are and uh yes it, it, on the impact of big business so when you see you know, technological trends like low earth orbit satellites you see oh okay this seems to be a bit different when you pay it forward you think well, hang on if i can get low latency communications to mm-hmm. anywhere on the planet what is that really doing for the world mm-hmm. you know but when when there's a community in papua new guinea in africa that has the same quality internet probably better than a lot of places in australia mm. what does that do for that community that you know that's that's transformational in one generation so mm. it kind of little simple changes like that that seem simple it's a simple thing for them you think to yourself well, that's going to have a big impact in the next 20 years mm. so we're getting towards the end of the podcast now. any pearls of wisdom that you'd like to leave with us pearls of wisdom i'd say Get over your own significance. <laughs> that's the, that's the, you're not that important. It's not all about you. What I found in life is don't be too significant. You know, and I get this with projects. I know what we're talking about earlier. Don't get too significant about requirements. Yeah. Don't get too significant about the product. If what you're chasing is a happy experience, then you kind of how you get it. It's it doesn't matter. The how mm. it's just the fact that you get it at the end and customer says thank you for listening and thanks for doing that thing that I asked you to do. And, and if, like, if that's puts a smile on your face, awesome, do that. And you made a really valid point earlier on too. There's just so many unbelievably clever people in the industry that are just surrounded by all these geniuses. It's incredibly humbling. So you, you get the point that you were making earlier on, absolutely. Yeah, so, Ash, it's been a brilliant, uh, brilliant conversation. Loved thank having you, you on, on here. Where can people find you if they wanted to uh, continue the conversation? Uh, I'd say LinkedIn. So okay. look up Ashley Neal, Focus, LinkedIn. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes. Go okay, Philly Boots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, do that. That'd be All nice. Right. Thank you once again for, for popping on. It's been fantastic. Thanks, Ryan. I've appreciated it. It's been awesome. And uh, thank you also for the audience. I look forward to getting another podcast out to you shortly. Thanks for listening to the Passionate About OSS podcast. You can find more episodes, more than 2,500 blogs, and our contact details over at passionateaboutoss.com.